The Great Exhibition ran from the 1st of May to the 15th of October 1851. To accompany our VR simulation of the exhibition, to be released free of charge in September 2024, we have created a five-part video series about the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations. Fox and Henderson obtained possession of the site in Hyde Park on the 30th of July 1850. Their first job was to enclose the construction site with hoarding eight foot high. Site offices, carpenters' sheds and similar site buildings were next erected, along with stables for the horses which would be required during construction. The building itself was then marked out on the ground, including all the points where the columns would be erected. A wooden stake was driven into the ground at the site of each column, and then a nail driven into the stake to exactly mark the center point of the column. The level of the floor was then marked by T pieces, marking the level of the top of the base pieces which would eventually support the columns. The first column was raised on the 26th of September 1850, just 58 days after Fox and Henderson gained possession of the site. Once two columns were raised, a connecting piece was attached to each end of a girder, which was then raised using the same apparatus and secured at each end to the columns. With the first four columns and girders having been fixed, the structure was self-supporting, hence it became its own scaffolding. Conventional scaffolding was not required, allowing rapid progress. The greatest number of columns raised in one week was 310. The roof trusses over the 48-foot-wide avenues were raised in a similar manner to the columns. Two vertical poles, joined by a horizontal piece, were raised into an upright position by ropes attached to the top ends of the poles, which were then secured to the ground. A block and tackle arrangement was then suspended from the horizontal piece, which was used to raise the various components and the workers. The fall rope was passed through a pulley near ground level, horses being employed to provide the force to lift the load. But for the longest roof trusses over the 72-foot-wide main avenue a somewhat different method was used. A single mast, over 70 foot high, was placed in the center of the avenue and steadied by ropes from the top and secured to the trusses in various directions. Chain was fed through the truss at two points, dividing it roughly into thirds, and the hoisting tackle attached to this. Raising these large trusses required the force of six horses. Two teams were employed raising the 72-foot trusses, starting from the center of the building either side of the transept and working towards the ends. Stout planks were laid on the ground upon which the foot of the mast rested. The large masts thus walked along the building by means of slacking, moving, and re-tightening the ropes attached to them and forcing the bottom along the ground by means of crowbars. Up to seven trusses were raised in this manner each day. It was reported that no significant accidents occurred during the process of raising the trusses. The 72-foot trusses nearest to the transept were double height, weighing eight tons each. To raise one of these required a team of 150 men. At this point, it is worth mentioning the lead flats. Most of the roof was glazed, apart from two 24-foot wide strips, one each side of the transept. These helped stiffen the structure to resist pressure from the curved transept roof. It also provided a working platform for the glazers. To glaze the flat roof, 76 glazing wagons were constructed. The glazing wagon was 8 foot square, resting on wheels which ran in the gutters mounted on top of and between the trusses. An opening in the platform allowed materials to be raised from the ground via a block and tackle. A canvas roof was laid over hoops, providing protection during bad weather. The workers would fix the glass in front of them, pushing backwards as each pane was completed. Just like the trusses, glazing work started at the transept and worked away from it in both directions. On average, each man laid 58 sheets of glass per day. The curved transept roof was also constructed in 24-foot sections. With large ribs at either end, two smaller ribs at 8-foot spacing, with purlins and tie rods. This assembly was moved on rollers to the square formed by the intersection of the nave and transept from where it was raised. However, the width of this assembly was 74 foot, whereas the clearance was just 71 foot 4 inches. In order to overcome this problem, one side was first raised 35 foot above the other. It took about an hour to raise the assembly from the ground to above the lead flat by a team of 60 men. Once above the lead flat, the assembly was returned to the horizontal and lowered onto a temporary tramway which allowed it to be moved to the correct position, whereupon it was hoisted again, 
the tramway removed and then lowered to mate with the top of the columns. The first such assembly was raised on the 4th of December, the 8th assembly on the 12th of December, once again completed without accident. To glaze the curved roof a 32-foot long stage, 3 foot wide, with a safety rail at the side, was constructed. It rested on rollers, travelling on the ridges of the roof. It was slung by ropes from the top of the roof. Eight men were accommodated by this stage. They started glazing at the bottom of the arch, working upwards. A small portion at the top of the arch was glazed from inside working on a scaffold suspended from temporary ties which had been attached to the ribs to prevent flexing as they were raised from the ground. The greatest number of men employed in one week was 2,260, and, being winter, work continued long after dark. Illumination was provided by bonfires at various points along the nave. At one time, 12 large bonfires were lit to allow the men to work beyond midnight. It was noted that very few accidents occurred. Although there were a few serious or fatal accidents, the exact number is not recorded, which were blamed on failure to follow safety procedures. For painting, scaffold boards were suspended by hooking onto the roof trusses. In this manner between 400 and 500 men were able to work at the same time, without interfering with work below them. This painting continued whilst the exhibitors were arranging their wares below. Water was supplied by the Chelsea Waterworks Company, brought into the building by a 9-inch pipe to the centre of the building, where it split into three 6-inch pipes extending the whole length of the building. Firecocks were spaced at intervals of 240 foot, with a pressure of 70 foot. This was subsequently used to supply the various fountains at the site, with sufficient capability to combat fire, should it occur. A supply of up to 300,000 gallons per day was guaranteed. By February, the building was sufficiently complete to allow the exhibitors to start setting up their exhibits. Everything would be ready for the opening on the 1st of May 1851. Look out for the next video in this series, where we look at the opening ceremony.